The D-backs were able to take two out of three from the St. Louis Cardinals behind some really great pitching by Zach Allen and Ryan Nelson. But will they be able to continue the momentum against the Chicago Cubs? You are locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked on Dimebacks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Millet Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer, so please check out my website, millerthomas 24myportfoliocom to see all of my latest work. That was our new intro here on the Locked on Dimebacks podcast, so hopefully you guys all enjoyed it. Our People behind the scenes down at Lockdown was able to whip that up for us. So shout out to everyone who worked on that project. Thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. One of those platforms is YouTube. We want to hit 2,000 subscribers by the All-Star break. So please hit subscribe to Locked on Diamondbacks on YouTube. On today's podcast, we'll be breaking down this series against the St. Louis Cardinals, talk about Ryan Nelson versus Brandon Fott for the final spot in the rotation, and we'll preview the upcoming series against the, against the Chicago Cubs. But first, I want to tell you guys that today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. From brakes to exhaust kits and beyond, eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride or die alive. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to bring home that big win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. But now let's get into the Locked on Dimebacks podcast and let's talk about that series win against the St. Louis Cardinals because game one didn't start off the best, right? D-backs lose nine to six, but they were able to come through the last two games to win two out of three against the Cardinals. Offense comes through in the middle innings. Zach Gallen, Ryan Nelson look phenomenal and the bullpen does its job to give the D-backs another series victory. The D-backs now on the season are back to 500. They're 8 and 8 on the year and I think they are better than what their record shows at just 500. They're at the time of us recording this two and a half games back of the LA Dodgers. I don't think the Dodgers have even played yet at the time of me recording. No, I'm recording this right before the Dodgers game even starts. So they could potentially be three games back of the division lead but regardless d-backs back to 500 and they're still chugging along throughout the regular season i think they're going to start getting a little bit better as this team gets healthier but just looking at this series against the st louis cardinals i was at two of these three games i was at the first two games of this series game one despite the loss it was a really fun time I mean, you had the six-run deficit by the D-backs where they went down early. That wasn't a good time. But me and my homies, we were like, you know what? Let's have a little fun. As the D-backs were entering the fifth inning, we were like, you know what? Screw it. Let's put 20 bucks down on the D-backs, on FanDuel, of, uh, on FanDuel, of course. D-backs plus 1,000 money line. Let's throw 20 on that entering the fifth. D-backs tied up in one inning with the six-run inning. Me and my homies are going absolutely bananas we're like we won the money we won the money it was only a tie game there was still a few innings left but we thought we won when eugenio suarez hit that big bomb d-backs still go on to lose unfortunately they couldn't finish the job but in the last two games they were able to finish the job against the st louis cardinals because the offense continued to really come through in those middle innings we saw lord guriel Contribute to that middle inning outburst that we saw in game number two where the D-backs were able to score three runs in the six. It was all courtesy of a big Lords Guriel bomb, which was 107, uh, which was 107 and a half miles per hour off the bat. Guriel has been fantastic for the D-backs to start the season, and he was fantastic for the D-backs last year to start the year. If you remember, Lords Guriel 
was an all-star last year for the D-backs and is because he started out the gate so hot. Through the first couple months last year, Gurriel had like a 300 average, a 900 OPS. When you look at his numbers right now, through the beginning part of the season, Gurriel's slash line, 297 average, 348 OBP, and a 531 slugging. Gurriel has come through with the power over and over. And most importantly, he's come through in the clutch with runners in scoring position. Gurriel entering Sunday's game over a 500 average and over a 1,400 OPS with runners in scoring position. He's been absolutely clutch for the D-backs this season. And then when you look at Sunday's game, once again, the middle innings is where the D-backs were able to do damage, right? They put up five runs in the fifth, and that's all they needed to put that game away. And what I really liked from that five-run fifth inning was two things particularly. One, he got Corbin Carroll to get his second hit all season with runners in scoring position. Carroll is such a dynamic player. He's the best D-backs player, and he has gotten opportunities with runners in scoring position, but he just has not capitalized on those opportunities this year. A lot of times when you're a leadoff hitter, those opportunities are not going to come as often, right? But Carroll has been batting number two a lot this season, and guys like Mookie Betts, Ronald Acuna, they do bat lead off for their teams, and they're still major run producers for their squad as well. Carroll batting behind a Keto Marte, who is constantly on base, constantly getting himself in position to score. We need Carroll to come through a little bit more at the top of the order because, again, he he still just hasn't gotten going as much as we want to, as much as we've wanted him to do this season. So hopefully, this would just Another positive trend for Corbin Carroll because we need to see him come through a little bit more with runners in scoring position. Then also from that inning, we got to see Jake McCarthy's second extra base hit against a right-handed pitcher this season. He's been way better against lefties this year, which is a little weird because Jake McCarthy himself is a lefty. So good to see him do some damage against righties. So those were the two things that I really liked from that inning. And then looking at the pitching from this series, specifically the last two games, Ryan Nelson in game number two, really, really good, really, really effective. Very impressive stuff by Ryan Nelson. Generated 10 whiffs on 47 swings. He went six innings, one earned runs. Yes, he gave up seven hits, four strikeouts, one walk, but only 81 pitches. And for Ryan Nelson... What he did in that sixth inning to get out of the jam, he starts it off with a triple. I think there's a guy that gets to second base as well with no outs. Like It was a pretty big jam for Ryan Nelson where the game could have got away from him. I think in the past, even if it was last year's Ryan Nelson, I think we lose that game because it gets blown open by the St. Louis Cardinals offense, but not this year. Ryan Nelson was able to take a deep breath and get himself out of the jam. And in the end, he had himself a very, very good outing in game number two. Love the way Ryan Nelson has looked this year. And then segment number two, we'll talk about if he can steal a job from Brandon Fott in the back end of the rotation. Zach Gallon in game number three, really, really impressive too. I mean, Zach Gallon, of course, the ace of this D-back staff, arguably. Some people will tell you Merrill Kelly. I'm not going to argue either one. But Gallon once, once again had himself a day on Sunday, 11 whiffs on 43 swings. His fastball velo was a little bit up as well, 0.4 miles per hour. It was up, so not a ton, but it's been down to start the season. So do like to see it trending in the upward trajectory. His stat line on the day, six innings, four hits, seven Ks, two walks. The thing with Zach Gallon, it, it still doesn't feel like he's at his peak self just yet, he started three different innings with a base runner, including a double in one of those innings, but it just didn't matter. He was able to work himself out of multiple jams. I don't feel like maybe outside of that Yankee start, like there hasn't been a lot of starts this season. Of course, he's only had four, but I haven't really felt like I've seen dominant elite Zach Gallon yet, which is kind of crazy to say because on the season, he's already put up 22 innings pitch. 26 strikeouts and just four earned runs. So Gallon by the numbers, he's right there for the Cy Young Award race. We talked about it on the podcast last week. I think on Friday's pod, he was like second in Cy Young Award odds on FanDuel. So with another start like that, just continues to 
early season favorite potentially for the Cy Young Award. And then the bullpen was pretty good in this series as well. We know about the Cashos and McGuffs. They continue to struggle. Ryan Thompson finally gave up damage for the first time this season. But we'll take it. Kevin Ginkle, dominant. He was shut down. Bryce Jarvis looked really good as well. Kyle Nelson as well. Bullpen was able to do their job. Starters elite the last two games. And the D-backs offense was able to come through in the clutch. Hopefully, this D-backs team can keep the momentum up as they face the Chicago Cubs next. And we'll be previewing that series in segment number three. But before we get into that preview, we first need to talk about eBay Motors because passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride or die every time or your money back because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to make your car the mvp and bring home the huge win keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to us customers i also want to talk to you guys about this new game that i'm addicted to called Monopoly Go because we've all been there either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heist and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. Play on countless dynamic monopoly boards, make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball, charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Let's talk about the battle for the back end rotation because Jordan Montgomery is not too far away. Sounds like Erod might be a little bit farther than we expected. D-backs recently paused Erod's throwing program before Jordan Montgomery. It sounds like he can be back by the end of April. So that means someone will be leaving this rotation. I believe that someone will be Tommy Henry. But I want to talk about the rotation if it was fully healthy. Who would be the number five starter? Because as it currently stands, I think it's a lot closer of a conversation between Brandon Fott and Ryan Nelson than we previously expected. Now, when will the rotation be fully healthy? I'm not too sure. Sounds like Monty should be back in the next week or two. For Erod, he's probably going to be out a little bit longer which we're not entirely surprised, right? Because Erod is someone that has dealt with a lot of injuries throughout his career. We knew that was his biggest weakness at the time of signing Erod was the fact that he never pitches a full season. He only has one season in his career with 160 innings pitch. For Erod, you want him to be healthy entering the postseason that's why the Jordan Montgomery signing was so important to have him coming back as your number three starter to hold down the rotation until an Erod also gets back. And then you can have your full complement of guys. This D-backs rotation, I think, can be the best in baseball, but it's going to be a while before we get there. 
Still excited to see Jordan Montgomery. Still excited to see Erod, but it's going to be a while before we see all the compliments in this rotation. That's why I'm going to have a very keen eye on who's still in this rotation when you talk about the Brandon Fots and the Ryan Nelsons because when this rotation is fully healthy, you're only going to have one of Tommy Henry, Fott, and Ryan Nelson. And I think Tommy Henry, with how he's looked this year, coming off the injury, how he's pitched so far this season, I think he's the odd man out. Tommy Henry, the last few starts, the numbers look fine. But when you watch him, it looks tough, right? It's not easy for Tommy Henry to battle through those five innings of three earned runs or less. He makes everything look difficult. That's why I think he's the odd man out. I think it's between Fott and Ryan Nelson of who's going to win that number five job. And as it currently stands, I think it's a lot closer competition than what we originally attended because my one of my predictions entering the season was actually Ryan Nelson potentially taking the job away from Brandon Fott, the number five starter job. Then after one start by both of them, I was like, you know what? I'm rescinding that prediction. I'm going to change it to Ketel Marte being a finalist for the batting title. I still think Marte is going to be a finalist. But I also think, you know what? It's not out of the realm of possibility that Ryan Nelson steals the number five job from Brandon Fott. Because as it currently stands through their most recent two starts, Ryan Nelson has just straight up out pitch Brandon Fott. Ryan Nelson in his last two starts, 11 innings pitch, four on runs, 11 strikeouts, one walk allowed. For Brandon Fott, 11.2 innings pitch, 11 earned runs, 11 Ks, three walks. Fott has given up a ton of damage and earned runs and some loud contact. Maybe it's not as much, maybe not as much loud contact as last year, but still a decent amount. Ryan Nelson is someone that is throwing a lot harder this year than he did last season. His fastball is up about a tick. His cutter is up like six miles per hour. Like there's way more heat on his stuff. If you look at his expected stats on his hard stuff, like his fastball and cutter, it's a lot better than what it was last year. His fastball, which we know is his go-to pitch, way more effective than it was last season. The, the issue for Ryan Nelson, his slider and changeup, his secondary pitches that he's been working on, they're actually less effective than they were last season. But if his fastball and cutter are humming, which is what he wants to hum, like Ryan Nelson wants to throw that fastball and he wants it to be effective. If those are effective first, then I believe that his secondary stuff will be effective shortly after if his fastball is, is humming and buzzing. So I'm not... I'm not saying Ryan Nelson is going to be a dude or a stud or live up to being a mid rotation starter. But if his fastball is playing the way that's currently playing, I think his second, I think his secondary stuff will eventually follow. And that could make him at least a better option for the number five starter job in this rotation. Thought right now, when you look at his stuff, his fastball and sweeper, of course, are his two go to pitches. Last year, it was his sweeper that was really effective, and it was his fastball that got crushed. This year, those splits are reversed. It's his fastball that's good. It's his sweeper that's getting crushed. So I don't really know how to fix Brandon Fott. His secondary pitches are still not that effective either. So when I look at these two guys, Fott, I think, is definitely the guy with more raw talent. But I don't think the D-backs are just going to go off raw talent. With who's performing better, I think Ryan Nelson is the guy that's pitching better right now. And I think the D-backs are going to make the move, make the decision that benefits the team most when it comes to winning. And if Ryan Nelson edges clearly outperforming Brandon Fott until Erod and Monty come back, then I think the D-backs will go with Ryan Nelson as their number five starter. Now, that doesn't mean Ryan Nelson is going to hold that job the whole season. That doesn't mean Brandon Fott can win it back due to injury or poor performance by Ryan Nelson. But as it currently stands, it's a close competition between those two guys. And if Ryan Nelson just continues to outperform Fott until this rotation gets healthy, I would not be surprised at all if Ryan Nelson ends up being the number five starter when it's all said and done. Now, we'll preview that series against the Chicago Cubs in segment number three. But before we get into that preview, 
I want to talk to you guys about your finances with Yahoo Finances because let's get straight to the point. You want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising costs of inflation, to pay off your debt or your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of you and financial freedom, right? With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, data, and tools that you need in order to help reach that financial freedom. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you are looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. They are the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. With a community of over 90 million users each month, their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For comprehensive financial news, and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast. And let's preview the next series for the D-backs against the Chicago Cubs because for the Chicago Cubs, when you look at their pitchers that they're throwing out, it's going to be an all-righty series for the Chicago Cubs, which is very interesting for the D-backs. Going back to last season, if you remember, the Cubs were a major reason the D-backs were able to make it to the postseason because the D-backs in a thick wild card race with the Cubs, murdered them repeatedly in the month of September. In the month of September, the D-backs beat the Cubs seven out of eight times, and those were the games that essentially swung the wild card race for the D-backs and put them in the postseason. So shout out to Chicago for letting the D-backs use you guys as a stepping stone last season on our way to the National League pennant. The D-backs this year would love to do what they did last September once again against Chicago. And with the Cubs throwing in all righty series, it could be interesting for the D-backs because when you look at the splits for the D-backs, righties versus lefties, they are clearly better against left-handed starters as opposed to right-handed started pitching. And so we're going to see which D-backs team shows up in this one because despite the D-backs not being exactly great against right-handed pitching this season, the starters that the Cubs are throwing out there, it's not exactly like it's the stiffest competition. All due respect to the major leaguers, Ben Brown, 6.1 ERA, Kyle Hendrick, ERA over 12, and then Jordan Wicks, ERA of 5.68. Yes, they're all righties. Yes, the D-backs struggle against right-handed starting pitching, but it's not elite, right? It's not like you're going against three Zach Gallons out there, right? This is not the toughest competition when we talk about right-handed pitching. Still have to give respect where respect is due, but would like to see the D-backs offense continue to look really good, especially with three dudes with a collective ERA around like seven and a half. For the D-backs, the starters that they have going against those Cubs starters, we're going to get Merrill Kelly in game one, Henry in game two, and then Brendan Fott in game number three. Like we talked about in segment number two, Tommy Henry is trying to make a case to stay on the Major League roster with Jordan Montgomery just around the corner. If Tommy Henry at least wants to be in the bullpen with a guy like Luis Frias struggling, Tommy Henry could make a case to be another long reliever, you know, lefty version of Bryce Jarvis in the bullpen. Maybe you could convince the D-backs to DFA a McGuff or something like that. But for Tommy Henry to stay on the major league roster, he's going to have to pitch well, which is something that he hasn't been bad at pitching. The last couple starts for Tommy Henry, like we discussed in the last segment, he's been fine. He's been able to battle through the innings, eat innings, and be at least semi-effective. You just don't have that trust of Tommy Henry being a high ceiling pitcher right now. He's giving you a good floor, but in terms of ceiling, I just don't trust it right now. So I would probably feel like he's going back to Reno 
once Jordan Montgomery comes back healthy to this rotation. And then when you talk about this D-backs lineup struggling against right-handed pitching, for most of the impact players on this D-backs team, it's not true. It's really just Corbin Carroll and Eugenio Suarez. When you just look it through the microscope of the biggest impact players on this D-backs team, it's Carroll and Eugenio Suarez that struggle the most. Suarez, three for his last 20 in a little bit of a mini slump right now. And also struggling against right-handed pitching on the season. This may not be the best series for him, but also, like we said, it's not like the elite. It's not like the most elite right-handed pitching. So hopefully this could also be the series where Eugenio Suarez finally gets going against right-handed pitching. And then for Corbin Carroll, I don't know why he struggled against righties this year. Like at least for Eugenio, he is a righty batter. So it makes a little bit of sense why he struggles against right-handed pitching. But for Carroll, I can't figure it out. I don't know why he struggled against righties this year. So we need this to be the series where maybe those struggles dissipate against right-handed pitching. Marte, Gurio, Walker, Jock, they have all been really good against right-handed pitching this season. I'm not worried about them at all. Moreno, he's been fine. Not worried about him. Jake McCarthy, he's been a weird guy because like we talked about in segment number one, he's been significantly better against left-handed pitching this season. So he's a guy like Carroll. You want him to get going against these right-handed pitchers of the Cubs who have been struggling this season. And then, of course, we are going to see more Jace Peterson in this series going against righty pitching. And I am just already frustrated with that because I know Tori doesn't want to play, doesn't want to play blaze Alexander every single day, but he just so much better than Jace Peterson, who only has one hit against a right handed pitcher all season. He just gives you absolutely nothing at the plate. And I wonder how much longer he has in the D-backs uniform because he's been a really non-factor for the D-backs this season. So I wonder how much longer the D-backs decide to keep playing him. And then when you look at the pitching, or excuse me, not the pitching, but when you look at the offense for this series, the starters for the Cubs aren't going to be good, right? So this might be a series that comes down to the offense because the bullpen for the Cubs also hasn't been that effective. Fifth worst bullpen ERA in the National League. But when you look at the offense for the Cubs, very similar to what the D-backs have done this season. In terms of runs per game and OPS, both of those teams are neck and neck. The Cubs are a great team with runners in scoring position, 884 OPS. D-backs are a better team, though, 932 OPS with runners in scoring position. The Cubs are also a team like the D-backs. They're at their best the first three innings of a ball game, 862 OPS the first three innings. The Cubs, like the D-backs, also struggle late and close in ball games. So both of these offense like to score early. Both these offenses can come through in the clutch, but when it's late in the clutch, both of these teams struggle, both of the same strengths and the same weaknesses. And that also includes the home road splits. The Cubs don't perform well on the road, 202 average and a 650 OPS on the road. So I'm hoping those home road splits can stay true and the D-backs can take another series off the Chicago Cubs just like they did last September as they marched their way to the postseason. Now that's it for this edition of the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. We'll be talking after the Chicago Cubs game. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Yo, sis.